All right, hello everyone. Today we're going to take a look at my favorite rule set, the Quality Assurance Manual, actually, <laughs> Sea Creek 5. Um, this rule set is an incredible rule set. It has the level of detail that you'd expect, especially for those rivet counters out there. It also gives you an enormous amount of variety, and even better, it gives you the ability to fight fights from 1880 all the way to 1945. Um, this game, just at first glance, just looking at the size of this binder, can seem intimidating, but it's actually very straightforward. So when you get this itself, the first section in this book is basically a big chunk of rules. I think there's about 87 pages. They're going to describe the process of the game, they're going to describe how armor works, they're going to talk about how night battles are fought, they're going to tell you how command is done, how reaction fire is done, they're going to tell you things about, you know, if it rains, they're going to tell you to take into account night factors, taking care of aircraft operations, submarine operations, there's a glossary in the back here. There's a huge section that describes how they chose to do their damage here, and it's just really, really impressive how much data they give you. It seems intimidating, but it's not as bad as it looks. The next section you get is going to be the data table section. In here, you get a huge chunk of information that provides you with, check this out, specific weather at specific times of year. It has a chapter in here that tells you what time sun rises, what time sunset is, depending on what time of year and where you are in the world. You have a section here that describes every torpedo in existence, pretty much until 1945. You have a section, I mean, again, this is almost worth just the price of admission. Every kind of radar, again, going to your daylight times. Every kind of airplane that pretty much ever existed until 1945 is in here, plus its stats, what it can carry, how far it can go, what its speeds are. Again, you can just see how deep this table is. It has a whole section here that describes anti-aircraft guns, how effective they are. So if you had a shore battery, you could actually work out how much effectiveness there will be. And then you get the really important part of this game, which are the charts, of which there are quite a few in this particular system. In the charts section, basically it's going to walk you through the basic process. And then the charts are labeled by letter by what are you trying to do. Yes, there's a few of these, but it's not really as bad as it sounds. In a given turn, um, basically you have a bunch of different phases like you do in most naval games. In this particular game, you start by writing out flag commands, which is your flagship's orders to all the people in his given division. Those flag commands can be things like continue as before, execute a special battle order, which you're going to define on a special sheet of paper before the game. You could have independent action, you could have cease fire, you could have them to retire, all these really, really cool things, simulating basically hoisting a flag or using a little flasher. It's really cool. You also get what they call bridge commands, where each individual ship, after receiving a flag command, can decide on its own orders, such as independent action, use a battery to attack, laying smoke, things along those lines. The reason they do this in this game is because if something happens to the ability to transmit a command or for the ship to execute a command, it's represented it extremely well. And this is one of those things, the example I always give is the example of the flagship taking a hit veering off course and actually getting sideswiped by the ship behind him because he wasn't aware that he wasn't giving orders at the time. There's actually an example at Tsushima, if you look up that battle, where that actually had happened. So it's really, really cool how that works, and we'll look at that in a minute. Afterwards, you have detail on the phonetic alphabets, uh, Beaufort scales, different types of wind if you're calculating your own type of ship. You have the thing where you can take a ship and actually decide if it has any random conditions based on you know how long has it been at sea, is it a brand new design, things like that. And you can actually modify this, and it's really, really cool how that plays out. You have a thing for gunnery scales, if you're doing alternate scales, things for turret designations, you have stuff about fire control, types of shells, it even tells you what ammunition loadouts. Yes, in this game you do track ammunition, so that's a bit of a surprise for some people, but I really don't think it's that bad. Moving on from there, we have a thing where you can determine how good the command rating is, damage control modifiers, visibility of signals. You have a whole entire section of visibility if you're trying to spot somebody during the day so that you can actually engage them. You have a piece about how fast you lose speed, what kind of damage is determination of merchant vessels. You get a really nice compass rose. You have an arc and file examples, and you have hit determination. This is the most important chart in the entire game, by the way. We'll look at this in a minute. Then you get things like, uh, let's see here, shell damage factors, penetration adjustments, damage determination, critical damage determination, aircraft modifiers, anti-aircraft modifiers, bomb penetration, mass movement, scales, fuel consumption, uh, torpedo tracking error, all these things. It's going to seem like a lot, but believe it or not, you only ever really use three charts. And I'll run an example for you in a second so you can see what that actually looks like. Usually this chart. Speaking of charts, every ship in this game should have one of these ship sheets. What the ship sheet does, it's going to be kind of tough to see. We'll try to give you a kind of a little bit of a close-up. Hopefully we don't go too far out of focus there. 
Uh, let's see, 3.6, uh, that looks pretty good right there. So basically what this particular ship sheet is, is it describes the guns on the ship, it describes the secondary batteries on the ship, it describes everything you could possibly need on the ship, the torpedo tubes, uh, what the fire control modifiers are, and then on the back side, you have a whole extra section on here as well, which describes things like how many hit points you have, the effects of damage and controls, all your flag, I should say bridge commands, you also have a thing at the bottom that allows you to keep track of fires. This seems like a lot, but again, it's really not as bad as it seems. So go ahead and zoom out a little bit so you can see that. So how does all this play out? I'll go ahead and show you. Let's say we're running a battle where the Mikasa, this is the battleship of Japan, this ship you can actually still see, I forget where it is, maybe Kyoto. Um, it gives you details about when it took place. Let's say it's at a range of 5,000 yards and wants to go ahead and attack itself for some reason. So um, let's go ahead, first thing we would do if we're shooting is we come over here, we say what turn number it is, what battery's firing, what the target ship is, what kind of shell we're using, then our fire control modifier. Let's say our ship's doing 10 knots. So what we do is we'd sit here and go, ah, 10 knots on this chart. Then we go our range, we said 5,000. So the closest 5,000 would be 6,000. That gives us short range. We look at short range, 10 knots. It would be an eight fire control if you're attacking his beam. It would be a five fire control if you're attacking his nose, or I should say his um, front, his bow, or his stern. So we'll go ahead and assume it's he's beaming them, so that would be an eight modifier. So then what you would do is you go ahead and um, you compare that and you add up all the different determination modifiers for this. Go ahead and try to take a quick look. Don't be surprised if I have to just focus in a second here. Told you. There we go, now we can actually read it. So in this particular case, you go ahead and see what about the visibility conditions. You take a look at dawn or dusk, night conditions, illumination, blind firing, smoke, emergency actions, target acquisition, under fire, over concentration, target ship, spotter, uh, factor. Factors that you get very, very quick at calculating very, very quickly. So in this case, our fire control modifier was an eight, if you remember, and we're attacking the ship for the first time, but it's the first turn, so we're gonna assume that our two hit is an eight. What we would do next, and this gets a little trickier, is we look down at here at the combat resolution chart. So this looks complicated. Again, it's not. So what we do is we take the battle fire control rating, or after all of these modifiers, which would be an eight, and we compare that to the number of shells we're firing. In this case, if we're firing a full broadside, two guns and two guns is four, times the rate of fire gives me eight shells. You wouldn't be using eight shells if you were acquiring the target because of the fact that you need those couple ranging shots, you'd actually use half but we'll use full amounts of shells this time. So we come down to eight shells, we compare that to the eight for that, and we need a 25 or less to get one hit, we need a three or less to get uh, two hits. And that's it, then you roll the dice. So what you would do next, is I'm gonna go ahead and zoom us back out here so you can see exactly what's going on here, is you go ahead and roll to determine where you hit the target. If you remember, we hit it at a broad aspect and we hit it at short range. You'd roll the dice, let's say you get 45. Finding 45 here would indicate we hit at 7V bar bat. And then what we do is we come over here, we take a look at the back of the ship, we'd see what the armor rating on the bar bat is. In this particular case, the armor rating is 11.6. That's a lot. So then we'd see if that weapon penetrates at that range. Flipping back here, it is a V hit. So the penetration at 6,000 is 10.4. In this particular case, the armor, if you remember, is 11.6, it would not be a penetrating shot. So what, what does that mean? That would mean when you come to shell damage factors, we would use the class C. So what you do now is you look at how big the shell is. In this particular case, it's a 40. Come down here and find the number 40, which would be right about here. Then we'd scoot over with our finger to the no penetration category. It's an AP shell, so we'd do 75 damage points anyway. So then if we were shooting at ourselves, like I was saying, we'd come up here, scratch that number out, and write out the uh, new damage. Actually, it's better to count up in this game, so we would write 75 up at the top of the margin there. Now, if the ship accumulated 224 points or more, we'd cross a damage tier, and we'd have to do damage control. Let's say that shot actually penetrated. So what we would do instead is we need to say, does the shot over-penetrate? Shots only over-penetrate if you are basically are double the uh, penetration of that particular section of armor. But let's say it didn't. So then you come over here, you roll your dice again, and you compare it to these three to see what, how much damage you did. Let's say it did 140 damage. Then you'd scoot over here, and you'd have a roll between a 1 and a 71 that would determine if you cause a critical hit, or what they call a damage effect. 
let's say we roll that and we got a 60. So we do a damage effect in addition to the damage. So to do that, what we do is we go scoot over here, and then you'd have a section. Let's go ahead and swing this over here so you can see it. You'd have a section down here that says uh, warships 1880 to 1905. We'd scoot down to where we got hit, which is the barbette, roll a random dice, let's say a 22. Screw rolling over here, a 22 on the barbette is a damage control, or I should say a damage type 103. So what does that mean? So what we do is we grab our little ship sheet here. We'd write in the turn, we'd write in the damage effect 103. Severity we don't know. We describe this as a damage type. Well, looking at this chart, you can see there are so many possibilities for a damage effect slash critical hit. Where do we get these from? You actually get these out of this here, this little handy dandy booklet the game comes with this called chart M1. Like I was saying, this is hit 103. So 103 in our particular case, uh, excuse my sloppy camera work right here. Go ahead and see if we can uh, correct that focus for you so you can actually read. There we go. So this one says that one primary turret or gun mount is out of action. So we go ahead and make a note of that on the ship sheet over here in this corner. A lot of times what they're going to do is they're going to say determine severity level. We'd roll another dice and add the size of the actual shell that hit it in order to determine how tough it's going to be to try to fix it. So then we roll to determine where the turret was affected. Turret may not fire for the duration of its effect. Um, you lose a rapid fire battery, which is a little difficult to deal with, especially if you get into aircraft. Then you determine which one. But here's one of my favorite features of this game is the fact that if you take a look, there's a possibility that that damage was actually bigger than you thought it was. So let's say we go ahead and roll the dice and we got a 10, uh, between a 1 and a 10, which means in addition to 103, we get another critical hit that was caused by this critical hit. In this case, it's 101, which if we screwed up real quickly, it looks like we have a fire in the primary battery magazine. So then, oh, that makes sense. We hit the primary battery, why not have a fire too? So um, then, of course, you can do the damage points by this hit, you know what the damage was earlier. And then again, this could be another cascading effect. And this is what I love about this game. Let's say we roll again and get an 8. So that would also be damage effect 100. So we've already caused two critical hits from one hit. Damage effect 100 is uh, everybody's favorite magazine explosion. Game over. So from that single shell hitting that primary battery, we're able to simulate its travel through the barbette into the thing, causing a fire, that fire spreading all the way down to the magazine and blowing the ship up. That is incredible. It doesn't happen every time, keep in mind. There's a lot of lucky rolls there. But it does allow for it, and that is what is so cool about this. There are many, 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 excuse my zoom here, there are tons and tons and tons of pages of critical hits. Everything from losing command capability, to losing an engine, to losing a searchlight, to if you're submarine flooding. It really is an incredible, incredible amount of detail, and it's probably one of my favorite features of this game. So that's about all there is to it. So of course, um, all damage would be simultaneous, so everybody would exchange fire, and then you'd go ahead and determine what actually happened as far as the damage itself goes, and then you'd move on. Uh, torpedoes are done a little differently, and I do want to bring that up real quickly. Scooting up to the T section for torpedo, we'll ignore aircraft for now. Keep going, keep going. Okay, so torpedo, there's two ways to do torpedoes. The first method is you can actually calculate the range in yards. By the way, when you do torpedoes, you'd fire them. Then you'd, um, if you think that the torpedo is within where the target is in the range bracket of the torpedo, you'd put down this little tool that people could see to determine if you got it right. Then let's say there is a chance of a hit. So what you would do here is you calculate the target speed, you calculate the target range. So you scoot over here, let's say it's 0.051 or something like that. Then you take that, modify it by any movement or acoustic torpedoes or anything like that, then you multiply that number by when you compare the actual angle of the torpedo hit, again you want a beam, gives you a higher rate, versus the length of the ship, and then you multiply those two together, use a calculator, and then you get the actual probability of the hit. So let's say we do get a successful hit, go ahead and skip over here like this, we'll go ahead and scoot back over here so you can go ahead and see. Assuming we get an actual hit, we check for duds, obviously. Uh, usually people check for duds before they actually check to see, do the multiplication, it's just quicker. Then you do the torpedo damage table, uh, depending if you do a contact or magnetic fusing. Then you'd modify it, did it hit the belt, did it hit the end of the belt, did it hit no armor. Then you do the total damage, and then you do a damage effect under the torpedo category. Scooting all the way back. Scooting. Then you go under torpedo, and then you go ahead and see what damage effect. Ooh, damage effect 100. Nice shot. Doesn't happen every day. 
There's an alternate method of doing torpedoes where basically you calculate the RTE. There's a little table. This is how fast the guy is. This is the RTE. Then you just go ahead and compare that to the distance. Let's say it's 1,000 yards. 250 feet, it's an 88% chance. Roll by torpedo launched, which is kind of neat. So that's pretty straightforward. Aircraft are handled slightly abstractly. Uh, basically what you do is you calculate how long they take to get to the target, how many drop out of the range, how many don't get to the target. Then you calculate any dogfights and intersections, uh, intersections, interceptions. Go ahead and jump back. Then you work out the air-to-air -air probability of, in this particular table down here, and then you calculate all that stuff. And it gives you, you know, the normal damage effects that you're kind of used to in the other situations. Uh, submarines are really, really cool because uh, submarines in this particular system are basically handled not abstractly, but kind of, where what you do is you write down three ideas for an attack. An idea for an attack, basically, pick a ship, you pick where around that ship you're gonna appear to do your attack, and then if you roll to see if you're successful at that, if you're successful, the uh, other team gets a roll to see if they detect you before you launch torpedoes. After you launch torpedoes, they get a roll to see if they detect you after that. If they don't, you get away clean. You can actually do the process again, assuming you have ammunition. Otherwise, they get to do some death charges, which is fairly simply managed, and I think it's actually pretty cool. So all in all, this is a really, really solid system. It does take a little while to work your way through a game, so I recommend you know maybe two, three ships per side max. If you're going to do airplanes and night battles, it's going to take a little bit longer. But I absolutely love the way critical damage is handled. And I, again, comes about pretty well. I'll give you guys an example of an actual in-game battle so you can see how that works later. Fire for the duration of its effect. Um, you lose a rapid fire battery, which is a little difficult to deal with, especially if you get into aircraft. Then you determine which one. But here's one of my favorite features of this game is the fact that if you take a look, there's a possibility that that damage was actually bigger than you thought it was. So let's say we go ahead and roll the dice and we got a one oh, uh, between a 1 and a 10, which means in addition to 103, we get another critical hit that was caused by this critical hit. In this case, it's 101, which if we screwed up real quickly, it looks like we have a fire in the primary battery magazine. So then, oh, that makes sense. We hit the primary battery, why not have a fire too? So um, then, of course, you can do the damage points by this hit, you know what the damage was earlier. And then again, this could be another cascading effect. And this is what I love about this game. Let's say we roll again and get an 8. So that would also be damage effect 100. So we've already caused two critical hits from one hit. Damage effect 100 is uh, everybody's favorite magazine explosion. Game over. So from that single shell hitting that primary battery, we're able to simulate its travel through the barbette into the thing, causing a fire, that fire spreading all the way down to the magazine and blowing the ship up. That is incredible. It doesn't happen every time, keep in mind. There's a lot of lucky rolls there, but it does allow for it, and that is what is so cool about this. There are many, 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 excuse my zoom here, there are tons and tons and tons of pages of critical hits. Everything from losing command capability, to losing an engine, to losing a searchlight, to if you're a submarine flooding. It really is an incredible, incredible amount of detail, and it's probably one of my favorite features of this game. So that's about all there is to it. So of course, um, all damage would be simultaneous, so everybody would exchange fire, and then you'd go ahead and determine what actually happened as far as the damage itself goes, and then you'd move on. Uh, torpedoes are done a little differently, and I do want to bring that up real quickly. Scooting up to the T section for torpedo, we'll ignore aircraft for now. Keep going, keep going. Okay, so torpedo, there's two ways to do torpedoes. The first method is you can actually calculate the range in yards. By the way, when you do torpedoes, you fire them. Then you know, um, if you think that the torpedo is within where the target is in the range bracket of the torpedo, you'd put down this little tool that people could see to determine if you got it right. Then let's say there is a chance of a hit. So what you would do here is you calculate the target speed, you calculate the target range. So you scoot over here, let's say it's 0.051 or something like that. Then you take that, modify it by any movement or acoustic torpedoes or anything like that. Then you multiply that number by when you compare the actual angle of the torpedo hit, again, you want a beam, gives you a higher rate, versus the length of the ship. And then you multiply those two together, use a calculator, and then you get the actual probability of the hit. So let's say we do get a successful hit. Go ahead and skip over here like this. We'll go ahead and scoot back over here so you can go ahead and see. See when we get an actual hit. We check for duds, obviously. Uh, usually people check for duds before they actually check to see, do the multiplication, it's just quicker. 
Then you do the torpedo damage table, uh, depending if you do a contact or magnetic fusing. Then you'd modify it, did it hit the belt, did it hit the end of the belt, did it hit no armor. Then you do the total damage, and then you do a damage effect under the torpedo category. Scooting all the way back. Scooting. Then you go under torpedo, and then you go ahead and see what damage effect. Ooh, damage effect 100. Nice shot. Doesn't happen every day. There's an alternate method of doing torpedoes where basically you calculate the RTE. There's a little table. This is how fast the guy is. This is the RTE. Then you just go ahead and compare that to the distance. Let's say it's 1,000 yards. 250 feet. It's an 88% chance. Roll by torpedo launched, which is kind of neat. So that's pretty straightforward. Aircraft are handled slightly abstractly. Uh, basically what you do is you calculate how long they take to get to the target, how many drop out of the range, how many don't get to the target. Then you calculate any dogfights and intersections, uh, intersections, interceptions. Go ahead and jump back. Then you work out the air-to-air -air probability of, in this particular table down here, and then you calculate all that stuff. And it gives you, you know, the normal damage effects that you're kind of used to in the other situations. Uh, submarines are really, really cool because uh, submarines in this particular system are basically handled not abstractly, but kind of, where what you do is you write down three ideas for an attack, an idea for an attack, basically pick a ship, you pick where around that ship you're gonna appear to do your attack, and then if you roll to see if you're successful at that, if you're successful, the uh, other team gets a roll to see if they detect you before you launch torpedoes. After you launch torpedoes, they get a roll to see if they detect you after that. If they don't, you get away clean. You can actually do the process again, assuming you have ammunition. Otherwise, they get to do some death charges, which is fairly simply managed, and I think it's actually pretty cool. So all in all, this is a really, really solid system. It does take a little while to work your way through a game, so I recommend you know maybe two, three ships per side max. If you're going to do airplanes and night battles, it's going to take a little bit longer. But I absolutely love the way critical damage is handled. And I, again, comes about pretty well. I'll give you guys an example of an actual in-game battle so you can see how that works later.